Or we hear that the priests of Delphi, one of the more common type of records, in that year reported a certain number of healings, or a certain number of oracles, or that navigators brought back their spices from the Far East. We hear a few things of this nature. But on this side of the year 600, we hear of nagging families, delinquent children, <coughs> fussy ancestors. We, we begin to hear of private lawsuits of the individual who dared to differ with authority. Uh, the person who appears in the petty courts to solve a grievance. He is only a shadow, it is true, but he is there. So we begin to have the history of peoples. We begin to have the history of the little individual and his place in the large picture. We also begin to gain considerable information, as Wilkinson points out, for the first time we begin to know what people wore, what kind of shoes they had on. We learn a little of the trinkets that they wore, and we learn the secrets of Greek and Egyptian cosmetics, and also vital statistics on the brewing of beer. We get all kinds of things that we did not know anything about before. So on this side of that critical point, humanity as we know it today comes into view. Now it could not have come into view and would have been meaningless had not this division period resulted in the rise of what we term today acute observationalism. Our philosophers began to accept the challenge of the Egyptian who said that the proper study for mankind is man. So attention began to be turned upon man. And from the sheer contemplation of divine matters and a recording of the activities of Olympian deities, history begins to take on the coloring of the human being, his relationship to history, and his relationship to the changing patterns of the day in which he lived. From this date, therefore, we must, theoretically, found our observational psychology. For we know that at that time the records were established, the analyses were made, the clinical observations were recorded, which made possible the work of men like Freud, Adler, and Jung. For from that time on, we begin to see a human being moved by compulsions, harassed by neuroses, burdened with frustrations, and valiantly struggling to adjust himself to the insecurity of his own internal life. Thus the emphasis upon all these elements of growth and the almost complete obscuration of politics. What do we know today, for example, actually, of the politics of Greece during the age of Grecian philosophy? We know almost nothing and care less. We know the archons were not all they should have been, but we took that for granted. We realize that in this period the great heroes were the thinkers, the creators, and that we are indebted to them for the mysterious rise of many systems of exact thought which we have built upon, but which we did not invent. The origin being in those earlier and perhaps less chronicled, but reasonably well-defined years. Thus, a great change did take place. And among the Egyptians, the attitude was held that there were streams of energy moving behind history. The history is the account of the physiological functions of one collective living entity. The history is the record of the life of an entity. That entity being composed 
of all living things functioning during that period or existing under that pattern. When the Egyptians formed their statue of Serapis at Alexandria, they composed its body by mingling together every known element and substance so that plants, animals, minerals, everything that man knew to exist, all these parts were fitted together into a strange and cunning contrivance and constituted the body of this deity. This deity is therefore a kind of historical personification because history is the story of the life in the rock and the shell. What we call geology is only a kind of history. Anthropology is a kind of history. And this entire pattern is actually finally only the report of the motion of energy. History is therefore the account of what energy does how it does it, and when it does it. History is consequently actually concerned not primarily with persons or even events, but with motion. And motion itself is a primary attribute of life. Life moving. Now life in its motion in everything that lives and moves is subject to the law of alternation. Everything that lives comes and goes, wakes and sleeps, lives and dies, grows and decays. Just as the annual story of the tree, which in winter drops its leaves and appears dead. So as Plato has pointed out, the great motions of energy are tidal. And these tidal motions mean that the flow of energy through the sequence which we call history is not continuously the same. That there are periods in which energy is superiorly abundant and there are other periods in which energy is deficient. And wherever energy is abundant, motion and the qualitative consequences of motion, these are themselves abundant, or as the Greek said, luxuriant. In a luxuriant period, there is an unfolding and releasing of life. Just as the individual feeling well on Monday turns out a great day's work and being a little weary of a Thursday does not do so well. So if energy is abundant according to the qualitative concept of the ancient, if the great tidal motion of energy is flowing, then there is a simultaneous release of vitality now, in many parts and levels of the world. Obviously, such release is again conditioned. The individual may feel very good, but if he has few abilities, he may still accomplish little. Whereas another man, not feeling even quite so well, may accomplish more because of having additional abilities and resources in himself. Therefore, a release of energy into organism or organization does not mean that all of these energized areas will react simultaneously or identically. But it does mean that there will be more energy available than at other times. And that this energy released in highly cultured peoples will result in strong cultural motions and released perhaps only through a warlike people may result in additional militarism or activity on that level. Also, in those epochs or eras in which energy is deficient, 
when the great tidal motions are ebbing, there will be a corresponding diminution of available resources. And this diminution, according to the Greeks, is notable first in the most sensitive areas of man's cultural existence. 